Good evening, and welcome. Uh, my name is Mark Berry. I'm the president and CEO here for Skudik Institute at Acadia National Park, and it's my pleasure to welcome you this evening. We do have a change in our program that I'll explain to you from how it was originally advertised. Uh, I also want to briefly introduce the Institute. So we are a nonprofit with a mission to advance ecosystem science and learning for all ages through a unique partnership with Acadia National Park. And this is uh, truly an outstanding place to get to work with the National Park Service, work to advance research and learning. And we do that in a variety of ways, but we have three sort of core focal points that we emphasize. Uh, understanding environmental change, increasing appreciation for science and science literacy, and supporting conservation and stewardship. And it's our work connected to conservation and stewardship that led to both our original topic for tonight and our replacement talk for tonight. I also want to briefly highlight a few upcoming events. You, you did find your way to this one, so perhaps you would have already found these. But this Saturday, uh, I want to thank Bar Harbor Whale Watch for hosting Skudik Institute Day on the Whale Watch. Uh, they have three trips during the course of the day. They're making a generous contribution to the Institute and accommodating our staff on each of those trips to speak with their guests throughout the course of the day. So if you happen to have time free and want to join us. Uh, Seth Benz, our bird ecology program director, will be on the first two trips, and I will be on the evening trip on Saturday. So it's usually a great experience, and uh, looks to be relatively calm offshore, which is also a good thing. Um, and then coming up on Monday, July 17th, again, uh, mentioning Seth, our bird ecology program director, he has a birding program that morning focusing on the returning shorebirds and waders. Seems amazing, but it's true. Shorebirds are already returning on their way south from the Arctic. Uh, I know it was kind of chilly today. I don't think summer's really over here. We'll get a little bit more. But amazingly, some of those birds up north are already on their way back south. Anyway, Seth does a great job. Uh, he'll be running that program each Monday, the next three weeks, so 17th, 24th, 31st. And then also coming up just next week, we have a brown bag talk at noon on Thursday, which is the 20th, and it's about Thoreau in the Maine woods. So Paul Johnson will be giving that talk. Those are uh, like this, a uh, free talk in this building, but across the hall, bring your lunch if you like, a uh, chance to ask questions and hear about something interesting. Lots more coming up through the summer. One more special event I'll highlight uh, coming up August 1st. Uh, former Maine Senator and Senate Majority Leader George Mitchell is going to be speaking at a special event for Skudik Institute. That's a 4 p.m. public presentation outside at Rockefeller Hall. Uh, if you don't know him, uh, he is a fantastic speaker. He will bring a great perspective on the current situation and it will be focusing his remarks on environmental stewardship and civic engagement. So we're very much looking forward to that and hope you may be able to join us. I know some of you probably be out of town by then. Um, I want to acknowledge a couple of groups that are with us this evening. We have some of our volunteers. I want to thank you, uh, both volunteers that are spending uh, occasional days or entire seasons uh, with us helping the Institute and the National Park Thank you, thank you. And then shorter term, uh, this team over here is uh, volunteering just for a, a shorter field program uh, with Dr. John Sigliano, who's one of our associated researchers with the Institute and studying ocean acidification in the intertidal. And they come to us through Earthwatch, which is one of our partners. We'll see uh, 10 teams of Earthwatch volunteers over the course of the year working on different projects here at Skudik Institute. Uh, you folks, as I understand it, are from Los Angeles and really happy to have you here with us. <clears throat> All right. 
Um, so our original talk for tonight was going to be about Lighthawk. And Lighthawk, uh, their presenter, Jonathan Milne, had a family issue come up and on short notice had to cancel. But I want to at least briefly mention uh, what Lighthawk is. They are a nonprofit that works uh, across a very wide geography, uh, but has previously been headquartered here in Maine. And essentially, it's an organization that brings together volunteer pilots that contribute their services to conservation. And they do that in a variety of ways. Uh, in a former position, I led a land trust. We worked with Lighthawk to occasionally get an aerial perspective on our landscape, either to obtain photography that we really needed or to bring uh, key people up in the air, whether they were uh, major funding partners, uh, major donor prospects, and give a perspective that can't be accomplished from the ground or from the water, which is especially important for very, very large landscapes uh, that you simply cannot see in a day otherwise. So they were very helpful to me in that regard, but they do more than that. They bring media uh, to see conservation efforts underway, to see environmental issues that play out across large landscapes, and they also get engaged in more unique missions, such as transporting endangered species long distances on short notice. Uh, so sometimes a wildlife rescue situation or a reintroduction type role. So a really interesting organization. Uh, the power of their work is obviously covering long distances, but especially getting an aerial perspective. And so one of the advantages of their presentation is they bring that aerial perspective, at least with imagery, and so we may be able to reschedule him in the future and keep your eyes open for that. We don't have a date as of now. But I'm especially appreciative that on short notice, uh, we were able to fill this slot and bring you another interesting talk about conservation. So uh, my friend, uh, Aaron Doherty, is the executive director of our local land trust here, uh, Frenchman Bay Conservancy. Uh, they do great work throughout the Skudik Peninsula and Frenchman Bay Watershed, and I will uh, leave it to Aaron to tell you more, but uh, you'll hear both about some of the access opportunities on conservation lands and some of the conservation work that the Conservancy has underway. So Aaron, thank you for stepping in, and we look forward to your talk. Thank you to uh, Mark Berry and Peter Collier and the Scudic Institute for having me here tonight. How's the sound quality? Can everyone hear all right? Great. Um, the Lighthawk talk sounds like a fascinating one. Let me know when that is, and I would love to come back. Um, hopefully, I'm a good substitute for them, and uh, I, I have uh, some exciting things to talk about tonight um, in terms of the work that we're doing at Frenchman Bay Conservancy. Uh, so I've been with the organization for three years. Uh, the organization is now celebrating its 30th anniversary this year, and uh, we have a number of projects underway. Uh, we have a capital campaign that we just launched that I'll talk about at the end of this presentation. And what I really wanted to do tonight was to share our work, why we do what we do, where we do it, and, uh, and showcase some of the trails that we have to offer that I encourage all of you uh, to go out and explore uh, if you haven't had the chance to do so already. And please uh, let us know what you think. And we also have regular volunteer work days every uh, Wednesday People meet up at the, our Tidal Falls Preserve, and I can, can show you where that is in a little while. Um, but they meet every Wednesday, and we go out to a number of different preserves and just maintain the trails and take care of downed trees or brush or whatever. So we, we definitely depend on that volunteer support. We have a, an active cadre of supporters who help uh, take care of our trails with us. So thank you to those of you who are um, involved in that already. So we exist um, for a number of reasons. Um, we have a mission to conserve distinctive ecosystems, landscapes, and water resources for the benefit of all, from the Union River and Frenchman Bay watersheds east to the Hancock County line. And we maintain 25 miles of public access hiking trails, like the one that you see here, uh, which is at our Korea Heath Preserve. Um, we have a number of other preserves. Korea Heath is, as the name implies, uh, in Korea, close by here, we also have the Taft Point Preserve, 
uh, which is land that was donated by Jeremy Strader before he passed away, uh, in the Francis Wood Preserve. Um, we have a number of others uh, nearby, but those are the closest ones to the region. So public access is an important aspect of our work, and this is done with support from people like you, support from members. We also work to protect clean drinking water. This is an image of Branch Lake, our city forest preserve in Ellsworth. Uh, this is an interesting property in that we worked with the city to conserve the property. Uh, we hold the conservation easement on it. The property is actually owned by the city and uh, it was sold by a, by a private landowner. The city was motivated to conserve it because it protects their drinking water supply. We were motivated to conserve it for the same reason and also protect, to protect wildlife habitat and now this is open for public access and it was protected in part through funding from Land for Maine's Future. A little closer to home in Sullivan, we have our Long Ledges and Baker Hill Preserves. And this also protects drinking water for the Sullivan Sorrento Water District. Um, we own land not directly up to the pond as this image implies, but the water district owns all around it. We were involved in that conservation as well as the conservation of the existing preserve, which we've added on to over the years. This was one where originally landowners who lived on the pond had some great property. They had some nice trails that they wanted to share with the public. And uh, uh, Rick Beckjord was, was one such landowner. Uh, Lee and Eleanor Ritchie, uh, who still live there as well. And then over the years, <clears throat> through donated conservation easement, and I'll talk about how this happens in a moment, um, and also volunteer trail development. This network grew out of their generosity, and gradually we, we protected the Baker Hill Preserve, and then with the support from landowners and uh, a willing seller uh, in Prentice and Carlisle, we purchased another uh, adjacent property. And in the beginning, we were thinking, well, we can have this corridor from the south end of Long Pond up to the north end of Long Pond, which actually isn't all that far from Skudik Mountain, so we could keep going up to Skudik Mountain as well. At the time that that idea first started, people didn't know whether it was going to be on the, the west side of the pond or the east side of the pond, and uh, gradually that became more clear as opportunities arose, and so this was a mixture of opportunities and uh, strategic conservation, but the end result is over a thousand acres of conserved land in a corridor now that stretches from, from uh, very close to Route 1 on the, the Punkinville Road um, all the way up to the, the main state reserve land and from there you can access Goodick Mountain. So this is a nice uh, achievement that uh, took place over about a decade. Another focus of our work, um, we're getting uh, a little bit more involved in outdoor education at this point, primarily in providing the opportunities for outdoor education. Um, and one example of that actually is with Skudik Institute. Uh, Nick Fisichelli, who's the forest ecology director here at Skudik Institute, has taken students out on uh, our Long Ledges and Baker Hill Preserve, that I, the map that I showed a moment ago, because that's right next to Sumner Memorial High School, and it's a, it's a great uh, location, a, um, a great opportunity for people to get outside and for young people to understand forest ecology and to begin to think about the changing landscape and to see uh, different stages of forest maturity. This here is at the Simon Preserve and students are working on tree identification. We've also partnered with uh, friends of Taunton Bay and uh, begun to go into some local schools to talk with school kids about our work as well and about conservation and about forests. Another focus of our work is wildlife conservation. And this land is so important as uh, habitat for wildlife uh, that we all value in the region. And um, whether, that's, whether that's deer or moose, how is that our Skudik Bog Preserve? Or black bears which was also captured on a game cam, and that was at our Long Ledges Preserve. And this, we posted on Facebook last year. Um, it was uh, filmed last summer, and we saw a mother, and I don't know if you can see them all in this photo, but four cubs 
which was impressive uh, to me, and I'm not a wildlife expert, but to my understanding, four cubs uh, is, is pretty good for, uh, for, for bears uh, to be able to have that many cubs that survive. And I think that's a testament in part to the, to the value of the wildlife habitat in the region. So now how we do uh, what we do, we conserve land through conservation easements or by owning property. And a conservation easement is a legally binding document that runs with the deed um, through time. So a landowner can grant a conservation easement to a, a qualified holder, in this case, Frenchman Bay Conservancy, because we were set up as a land trust to, to do this sort of thing, to hold property and, and also to hold these kinds of voluntary agreements. And for example, the agreement could say that we are going to uh, give you, the land trust, um, the rights that we would have had otherwise to develop the property, to subdivide the property, uh, to build on it. And the reason that we're going to do that is because there's valuable farm fields here that we really want to conserve, or there's valuable forests, or we love the trails here and we want to make sure that people enjoy this property in generations, for generations to come. Um, now, those, the rights that are given uh, to a land trust and a conservation easement vary case by case, very widely. And uh, sometimes landowners retain the rights that allow them to harvest timber, um, or there's a, a carve out for a house that uh, maybe people you know, have another generation and the children may need a house on the land in the future. So it's a very flexible instrument. Um, and sometimes it allows for public access, other times it does not allow for public access. And these are things that are negotiated between the landowner and the land trust. And it's all on a voluntary basis um, easements can be purchased or can be donated. We hold uh, 31 conservation easements now, and um, I believe all of those easements were actually donated to Frenchman Bay Conservancy. The other option is by owning property, and we have purchased quite a number of properties. Properties have also been donated to Frenchman Bay Conservancy. Uh, properties have been bequeathed to Frenchman Bay Conservancy. In fact, we um, recently received a bequest uh, from someone who was a longtime supporter of Frenchman Bay Conserv Conservancy, and it has over a mile of river frontage uh, on a river in a, in a priority conservation area for FBC. And uh, what an incredible legacy, what an incredible gift that this person gave to our organization. And uh, we're now working through what the next step of that's going to look like, um, how much of that we're going to retain, are we going to retain all of it, um, how we're going to conserve that land, how we're going to develop trails on it. And in doing that, we're reaching out to the town, uh, reaching out to the elected officials, and trying to understand what it is that people want in those communities. So the way that we work is, is varied and flexible. And it's, uh, it's really direct one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, it starts with one-on-one -on -one conversations with individuals about what they want to see, how they want to see their land conserved. This is where we work. This is a, <clears throat> a partial map of where we work. Our, conserved landscape actually continues north through here, but it was a little hard to fit it all on this page and actually show you um, a number of dots without having it all be clumped together. So we are actually down off the, the map here. Uh, but this is the Korea Heath Preserve, Francis Wood, Taft Point that I mentioned earlier. Uh, we also have a uh, Upper West Bay Pond Preserve here. Um, the reason it's not on the map in this particular instance is that uh, the access to it is, um, it's really, it's a water access at this point. And we don't, we don't own the access, but it's been um, broadly understood that, that people can put in boats there. So we'll probably put this one back on the map. We will put that back on the map. Uh, Little Tunk Pond um, is, a, is another beautiful location. Some of you may be familiar with that. A short hike into a great pond, a nice swimming hole. Um, Long Ledges, Baker Hill, Skudik Bog, Skudik Trail Connector. This is that corridor that I talked about a moment ago that's a recreation corridor. And uh, part of the trail there was developed by the Maine Conservation Corps, a group of, of uh, uh, primarily young people, uh, in fact, I think only young people in that case, uh, who were out um, for the summer working on trails in different locations for six or eight weeks at a time and camping in the woods. Um, and, and they did a fantastic job building, building stone staircases and and uh, small bridges across streams, and side hilling to, to make an even trail on a, a slope. 
Uh, so I would definitely encourage you to check out those places. So now, what are the environmental threats to Down East Maine? And this really gets to why we exist. Unfortunately, there are a number of, of threats. We live in a beautiful place, um, but we are not immune to the kinds of threats that are affecting the entire state, affecting the entire country, the entire world. Those things include habitat fragmentation, uh, excessive or, or poorly planned development, loss of wildlife, ha wildlife habitat, loss of clean, clear drinking water. So let's start with drinking water for a moment first. <clears throat> I actually uh, borrowed this slide from another presentation. Uh, a land trust in, in western Maine uh, was working on conserving land around their lake. And uh, I think they did a fantastic job of describing why conserving land around water bodies is so important. So this shows that developed watersheds contribute five to 10 times the amount of phosphorus in the runoff from a, a developed area as opposed to a forested watershed. And so all of that, all of those nutrients that are, are leaching out of the soil or, or running over uh, paved surfaces into the watershed are uh, very detrimental uh, for the wildlife in the watershed and, and can lead to eutrophication, um, can, can lead to a sort of uh, low oxygen, hypoxic environment, and it completely changes uh, the ecosystem. And that has implications for uh, drinking water, for recreation, for wildlife. This shows the, the problem with imperviousness, and I think it's a, a good answer to the question of how much impervious surface is okay, and uh, the answer is probably uh, the less impervious surface, the better. Um, so those lakes and ponds that have houses around them are particularly vulnerable, uh, if there's a lot of development, particularly vulnerable to um, the sort of detrimental effects that I was mentioning in, in uh, their pond. I was just up at the Abrams Pond uh, annual meeting, the Abrams Pond Association uh, annual meeting yesterday, and that's an organization that has organized and done a very effective job in... Um, addressing non-point source pollution runoff problems into their, into their watershed by addressing culverts, um, addressing road erosion, um, addressing um, unnecessary um, or excessive uh, spraying of, of lawns, uh, those kinds of things um, that in individual landowners can do that really make a tremendous uh, impact on the overall watershed. I also want to talk about fragmentation. <laughs> It may be a little bit difficult to see this, but um, each of these columns shows different level of fragmentation of the landscape. And so on the far left here, we've got a landscape where parcels are 500 to 25 um, acres in size, or tracts, not necessarily parcels, but undeveloped tracts of land. Right? So that's one end of the spectrum. If you go all the way to the other, where the landscape is more fragmented, and you think there's if you, can, if you can imagine it, there's more roads in between, there's more houses, it's been chopped up into smaller and small, smaller parcels. So on, this, uh, on the far right side here, we have tracts of land that are one to 20 acres. And now down here is a list of different species of wildlife that you could expect to see. Um, the ones on the left depend on larger landscapes, the ones on the right depend on, uh, or, or they're more generalists, they can survive in landscapes that are more fragmented. So I'll just read this list, raccoon, uh, small rodents, rats, mice, uh, cottontail rabbit, probably not around here, squirrels, woodchuck, muskrat, red fox, songbirds, skunk. You see them anywhere, right? But on the other side, that moose that we saw in the video a moment ago really needs this larger habitat. Even deer need, need the, the larger wildlife habitat. If you look farther down the list, you see quite a number of, of birds, uh, a lot of species. The kinds of animals that I think we're uh, privileged to see here in Maine, uh, like, like moose, uh, bobcat, fisher, I mean, they may be rare sightings because they're, they're sort of reclusive animals, um, but you don't see them if you're in a developed part of the state or a, a developed part elsewhere in this country. And so uh, development is, is another uh, threat that we face, and you don't have to go very far. Thankfully, this photo was not taken in down east Maine. Uh, but you don't have to go very far to see this kind of image. 
Um, and, and this water is unfortunately so filthy that even the turtle doesn't want to go into it. Um, but this is, this is algae, and this is what happens when you have this heavy nutrient loading in, in ponds. Um, so all of this is really my uh, attempt to explain to all of you why conservation matters, in particularly around water bodies, in particular around water bodies. So what are the solutions to these problems? Well, uh, conservation, land conservation, is aided by uh, planning. And this, this is uh, planning that was done by the state with support from a number of uh, nonprofit organizations. This is the beginning with Habitat program. Uh, these maps are available by Maine's Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife. It's a fantastic service that's provided by the state of Maine. Uh, we've worked with some of the members of, of that uh, state department um, directly on projects. They provide these maps anytime we want, and it's, uh, I can't say enough good things about it. But what the map shows is, um, first of all, let me point out that we're, again, off the map here. So this is uh, Route 1 running through Gouldsboro. And so Taft Point is over here, Jones Pond, Grand Marsh Bay, uh, West Bay. So you, so you can get a, get a sense of where we are. Uh, but this shows deer overwintering habitat. It shows um, inland waterfowl and wading bird habitat. And then in each of these, while I don't expect you to read them, it shows priority species. So speedy, species of greatest conservation need, which is a state designation. You know, some of uh, the habitats uh, that these particular species need are, are in these locations. And so this is one of the ways that we can begin to prioritize how and where we're going to conserve land. And again, this is a voluntary basis, working with landowners in those particular uh, communities. But it helps us to think about, of all the places we're going to go, which landowners are we, go are we going to talk to? And, and what are the areas that are uh, perhaps highest priority? So this is one tool that we have available to us. Um, we're also thinking about, uh, about climate change and about how our landscape is going to change with climate change. Um, how uh, species may, may migrate and how the distribution of the species is going to shift over time, um, which is in part dependent upon uh, the landscape itself, the landforms that are, are part of the landscape, uh, which direction, north, south, east, or west, are the slopes facing. Um, and, and species diversity, species composition. And I'm not going to go into detail on this particular image, but I put it up here to show that this is, in fact, a gradient. So there are some areas where uh, there's higher climate resilience, meaning that if we protect those landscapes now and we prevent the kind of fragmentation that, that I showed earlier, that I talked about earlier, we have a better chance of protecting this species assemblage that um, provides for a, an intact uh, ecosystem. And uh, this is one of the places that we have conserved. This is our Upper West Bay Pond Preserve. Uh, this is also a high value habitat for inland waterfowl and wading birds. And we are, are doing conservation. Uh, we're conserving land right next door um, with funding from the federal government through a Fish and Wildlife Service program called the North American Wetland Conservation Act Fund, or NACA. And uh, this is a million dollars that was provided to a partnership that we're involved with, along with uh, Maine Coast Heritage Trust and Skudik Institute. And uh, this partnership provides a million dollars. We supply $2 million in match contribution. That can come from uh, cash contributions, donations to our organization, as well as land. So what I mean by land is when Jeremy Strader donated his beautiful 64 acres in Gouldsboro, that counts as a match contribution towards this grant. So it makes sense why the federal government or why any granting agency would want that match contribution because it leverages their money. So for every dollar that they give, we supply an extra $2. And that, that is um, uh, part of the motivation for getting that award. And we're, we're thankful to get that. I wanted to show this because I think that it also um, points out another one of the large landscapes that we're working to conserve. And we're down here on the end, surrounded by Acadia National Park. And then uh, to the north, Forbes Pond is an area where, where Maine Coast Heritage Trust has been working uh, for a number of years. Actually, Frenchman Bay Conservancy um, has also looked at that property, for at properties around that pond for a number of years. Um, 
West Bay Ponds, and then on up towards uh, Tonk Lake. And you see all the different colors. You don't necessarily need to know all the organizations, but this conservation, uh, uh, the conservation footprint on this map here includes support from um, Inland Fisheries and Wildlife, Bureau of Parks and Lands, the Nature Conservancy, Frenchman Bay Conservancy, Maine Coast Heritage Trust, uh, the, uh, the Park Service, and others, uh, both through ownership of land and also through conservation easements. So it's, it's these partnerships that really uh, protect the landscapes in the long run. And this particular corridor is nationally significant. And the reason is because this is one of the few places remaining on the entire eastern seaboard where there's minimal fragmentation between the inland forest, in this case the expansive northern forests of Maine, all the way down to the coast. Of course, Route 1 runs through this. There are other roads. There's development along the way. But it's one of the few places where wildlife can pass back and forth. And so I showed the moose earlier. You could still see moose in Acadia National Park, the Skudik District of Acadia National Park down here. I don't, I don't know if any of you have seen moose down here or not, but Mark raised his hand. There you go. So keep your eyes out. And uh, this is another uh, beautiful photo. Jerry Monteau took this photo. And uh, this is the, the Lower West Bay Pond, a property that we have also focused, um, we've, we've prioritized over the years. And uh, we're, we're looking to conserve more land there as well, in part because of its value for, for birds. And Mark mentioned a moment ago that some of these migratory birds are coming back from the, from the Arctic Circle, headed back south, even though it's, it's summer, it's, it's early, it's a long flight for them. They need places to stop along the way. And, and this is one of those places that provides the kind of habitat that they really need. So how do we fund this work? Private foundations is, is one source of funding. Uh, we recently received support from the Elmina B. Sewell Foundation, uh, Davis Conservation Foundation. Uh, we've applied to the Quimby Family Foundation. Um, you, you get the idea. There's, there's a lot of family foundations in Maine. Uh, we are, we're blessed with that philanthropy. I think we're also blessed with having a lot of nonprofit organizations that provide all manner of, of, of services. Um, but there's, there's still not enough money in private family foundations and other uh, foundation funding to do this work. Public funding sources is another one. And I mentioned the NACA fund, which is Fish and Wildlife Service money. Uh, we've also gotten funding from Land for Maine's Future. And I, I just want to take a moment to, to talk about Land for Maine's Future really briefly, because I know it's been in the news. Um, it's, it's, turned into a, it's been turned into a contentious sort of issue, although I don't think there's really much contention. It was widely supported uh, with strong majorities, 60% plus, as uh, bond measures, public funding in the state of Maine, that would conserve land for uh, public access, for hunting, for fishing, for access to the shore, for outdoor recreation, all across the state of Maine. And it's a fantastic program. Actually, there was a great segment on uh, 207, uh, which is a a, um, a television show. Uh, we just posted it on, on uh, our Facebook page. And uh, if, you, if you didn't get a chance to see that, check us out on, on Facebook. You'll see that link. But uh, it was Tim Glidden, who was the former LMF director, now uh, the president of, of uh, Maine Coast Heritage Trust, and Carrie Kinney from Kennebec Estuary Land Trust her talking about this work. And we're really hoping that uh, in the coming years, we'll have the opportunity to reinvest that energy into land for Maine's future. Those states across the country that have done that kind of thing have uh, made tremendous strides in protecting their land, and we, we hope to continue that uh, legacy here in Maine. So the last one, uh, perhaps most importantly uh, for everyone here tonight, most relevant, is people like you. And our membership provides the base of support that we need. Uh, we are, as I mentioned, launching a capital campaign now, and that is in part to uh, revitalize our flagship preserve at Tidal Falls in Hancock. And that's also to reach out much more broadly to people all across Hancock County and uh, build our membership, bring in more people to, uh, to hike our trails, to do that kind of volunteer stewardship work that I was talking about, and to provide more funding for vital land conservation and stewardship in the long run. So the Tidal Falls Preserve, uh, 
Many of you have, have been there before, I believe. I've talked to some of you about it. Uh, we have Monday music events there uh, for seven weeks in the summer. We've got five more this year. We started out with uh, Gus LaCase the first Monday. We had Flash in the Pans last week, which was fantastic. Uh, they put on a great show. We've got New Shades of Blue coming up uh, next Monday, so come check it out. It starts at 6.30. We also have our annual uh, lobster dinner, which I believe this year is on the 21st of July. And it's, it's a great place. Thousands of people go there every year to enjoy the falls, um, at, at reversing falls, and uh, to, to have picnics and, and visit with family and friends. What we're doing is um, bringing the developed footprint that was on the landscape back from the shoreline and restoring that shoreline by moving ourselves up the hill to this building that we purchased and putting a new education center in that building. We're really excited to finally have the opportunity for people to come in, come through our doors to see the work that we do and, and to see uh, video and photos and to, to do some hands-on work. Uh, Mark was just mentioning to me today, if you put out uh, paper and crayons and a couple things that you found off the beach, shells or, or uh, what have you, that's all you need as the incentive for, for kids to start drawing. And that kind of creative output is what gets people thinking about the outdoors at a young age. So we're really excited to finally be able to have the space to do that. We are also conserving Marlboro Beach. And uh, this is one of my last slides, but this is uh, a beach in Lemoyne. And a resident of Lemoyne came to us and said, you know, this property is going to be up for sale. The, uh, the Norris family that owns it <clears throat> um, had wanted to see it conserved. Um, uh, Mrs. Norris, who passed away several years ago, wanted to see it go to the town. And the family would still like to see that happen. And he asked, could you help make that happen? I said, absolutely. This is what we do, and, and we would love to, to partner. And in this case, the, the outcome is different, where we're not holding the property in the long term, but, long term, but we're giving it to the, the town of Lemoyne. So we're currently fundraising for Marlboro Beach, and we have a, a donor who's providing matching funds. So every donation that comes in is matched dollar for dollar up to the $45,000 that we need to raise to purchase this property and uh, put a deed restriction on it that ensures that it remains open for public access forever. And we're going to give it to the town of Lemoyne. The last property that I want to talk about is the Jordan Homestead. This is 30 acres in Ellsworth along the Bayside Road. It's a, it's a wonderful opportunity because it's quite close to our Indian Point Preserve, but it also provides a link between Bird's Acre, which is a popular uh, hiking spot in town in Ellsworth, all the way down to the Union River. And so it's going to provide public access to the Union River uh, in, a, in a beautiful place. If any of you have, have uh, been on a boat between the, uh, the little anchorage in Ellsworth, the harbor in Ellsworth, uh, down to uh, where the Union River Bay opens up, you've, you've probably had the same experience where there are a few houses along there. Um, it's, it's quite common to hear kingfishers and see them zipping back and forth across the water, to see a blue heron take off, a bald eagle fly overhead, and, uh, and big towering pines on either side. So it's a really spectacular location. We want to make sure that it remains spectacular. And so we are going to conserve these uh, 30 acres. We have a, an option on this property. It's not conserved yet. Uh, we just received a contribution of $30,000 towards the conservation of, of this property. Uh, we have two, a total of $210,000 to raise. And uh, every, every size contribution towards us absolutely helps. So um, we're excited to do that. And uh, I just wanted a, basically a picture of cute kids um, because I think that the next generation and all subsequent generations is really why we do what we do. And so I'm going to end there, and thank you for giving me the time to talk with you all tonight. So I'm happy to take any questions that you may have about our work. And uh, we do have one request in that regard, in the interest of helping people that may have more difficulty hearing, that you use one of these microphones, which I'm happy to run to you. Uh, if 
you do use this microphone, it only works if you use it like this. It really doesn't do anything if you use it. So you need to put it near your mouth if you're going to use it. Uh, but if you have any questions for Aaron, please raise your hand. You were very clear. <laughs> I'm new to your area. You mentioned the tidal falls are reversing falls. Could yes. you explain what that means? Sure. It is the water body that empties Taunton Bay into Frenchman Bay. Um, let me see if I can pull up a map here. And um, I won't spend too much time looking at, at this, but uh, if I have a map, I can explain to you. So uh, Tidal Falls is right there. And this is what would be called the Taunton River, although it's uh, more of uh, an extension of a bay. This is Taunton Bay. The upper part is Hog Bay and Egypt Bay. And it flows down into Frenchman Bay. And it has all of these little feeder streams coming into it. But all of that water, twice a day, every day, flows in and out with the tide. So on a high tide, it's a falls flowing in, flowing upriver. And on a low tide, it's, it's outgoing. Um, so you get to witness that every, every day, in and out. And uh, on a high tide, the full high tide, people show up sometimes and say, where's the falls? I don't see anything. And it's because it's totally flat water at that point. So our answer is, well, wait a couple of hours and you'll see it. It's not a dramatic drop. It's not a high vertical drop. It's not that kind of a waterfall. Uh, it's, it's more of a cascading falls, like rapids in a river. And I believe the tidal swing there is about 12 feet. Um, so this portion of eastern Maine, and obviously as you get farther east and up into the Bay of Fundy, where they have the highest tides in the world, um, you know, we have a nice opportunity to see that large tidal swing. And as a result, this estuary up here is particularly valuable. In fact, we're focusing some of our conservation work now right in that region in Hog Bay. And we received another $100,000 from the US Fish and Wildlife Service through their small NACA program uh, to work in that region, in part because it's some of the highest value habitat for priority bird species of any area in the, Frenchman Bay, the broader Frenchman to, to Blue Hill Bay region. Also, one of the only places around here you can find horseshoe crabs. So one of the northernmost population of horseshoe crabs uh, spawns up there. Uh, other questions for Aaron? Anyone over here, something he talked about that uh, maybe wasn't so familiar to you? Peter, do you have a question? Thank you. <clears throat> Great presentation. I, I was just curious if you could describe if uh, or what scientific research, if any, is happening on the conserved lands or and or perhaps a little more detail in the NACA grant. Uh, what I guess what the long term focus is. Be, I guess looking beyond conservation, it's amazing all the acres. I would just be curious to, I mean, here at the Institute, there's always this focus and we have scientific research happening a lot. You talked about some youth science that's happening, which is perhaps the most important type, but um, is there active, are you partnering with universities and, and other research organizations? So that is a great question. Um, that's partly where you guys come in, actually. Um, we're glad to work, as I mentioned earlier, with Nick Fisichelli, the Forest Ecology Director at Skudik Institute. And, uh, and that's really where, you know, I think that the science in the you know, more specific sense is, is happening is in partnership with uh, groups like Scudic Institute, um, also the University of Maine. We're, we're part of a group called the Downeast Conservation Network, which is a, which is a regional conservation partnership. And um, one of the members is from the University of Maine, and he had a graduate student who was very interested in, in studying forest ecology and also understanding some of the changes in the landscape. And we're looking for, um, for properties that, ha uh, for, for, for areas of forest that had uh, you know, specific types of, of trees, a specific landscape. And, um, and so some of our properties were able to provide that. So we're, we're excited to have that opportunity. Um, the Down East Conservation Network, uh, its first name was Down East Research and Education Network. 
and it still retains those, uh, that, that important focus of research and education. Um, and that's in part because of the partners that are involved in it. It's, it's a regional conservation partnership where um, we, we share ideas and resources and collectively focus on conservation and stewardship. Uh, but we also do more than that, and we want to make sure that these conserved lands are also available for research and, and education in the long run, and that we have the opportunity to communicate out to everyone why this is important in terms of the economics, the economic value to this region. So conserving land is not, is not the end. It's not, it's not like when the land is conserved that it's just, that's done, uh, goal accomplished. It's, it's a long-term, it requires long-term management, and it has uh, implications for that place in the long run. So this is getting beyond the answer about research um, and education specifically. Uh, but the value of conserved land is, uh, is pretty important for surrounding landowners and for maintaining the quality of place in the region. Any other questions? Well, thanks again for having me. I really appreciate it. You did get it. one more. I'm going to put you on the spot for sure. one more. Um, so you outlined a lot of the threats that you see as um, problems for Down East Maine, but what would you consider maybe the greatest currently in the region that your conservancy is? Uh, well, <laughs> that's a good question. No, I'm really glad to get that question. Uh, th so the greatest conservation threat is, is what you're talking about. I, I think climate change, uh, without a doubt, is, is the largest in terms of magnitude um, in, in a major impending threat. And uh, it's, it's one that it involves a lot of different things. And, um, you know, it's it most directly uh, created by uh, increased emissions into the atmosphere, obviously. But the effect that it has on the landscape involves um, acidification of, of the ocean. Um, it, it impacts, uh, you know, our rivers and streams as well. Uh, it impacts the landscape in terms of uh, changes that, that we're seeing and whether or not, you know, there's, it's an open question as to whether or not um, the sort of migration and adaptation that's required for um, a viable natural environment to remain can happen at the same pace as climate change. And so we're seeing a disconnect, for example, in predator-prey interactions. Um, you know, that, this is, I think, one great example is in the marine environment and, and um, I heard this from a, a woman from Fish and Wildlife Service who talked about uh, um, herring and the availability of, of uh, herring and other uh, prey species for seabirds, for nesting seabirds. And, and when, the, when the chicks hatch out, they need to have food. And if the food that's available at the time that the chicks hatch out is uh, not the right kind of food, either because it's not that lipid-rich uh, prey source that they need that they would get in herring, um, or it's too big, so it's the wrong size. If for whatever reason there's a, a mismatch between the predator-prey um, species, then, uh, you know, then there are severe consequences. In that case, there was a major die-off of um, uh, a whole, uh, you know, life or a whole year class of, uh, of birds. So these kinds of things are, are real serious threats, and I think that it's an important um, driver for our work because a role that we can play is to conserve landscapes strategically so that uh, landscapes are not left as pocket isolated ecosystems, um, but, are, but remain as part of a matrix, part of a connected landscape. Thanks for your question. Great. Thanks again, Aaron. And, and before we break up and maybe go into smaller conversations, I want to again uh, thank Aaron for stepping in on really short notice. It's a testimony to the fact that we already work closely together and you heard about that in the context of the Down East Conservation Network. And I probably should have mentioned that I was actually already on the calendar for a speaker series that Frenchman Bay Conservancy does in partnership with Friends of Taunton Bay tomorrow night. <laughs> so I'll be up there at seven o'clock and so we're kind of swapping back and forth a little bit. I'll be uh, talking about all the work that's going on here at Skudik Institute and with our partners. So if you happen to be in the neighborhood for that, it is just uh, upstream or up bay uh, north of Tidal Falls. And uh, again, that's 7 o'clock tomorrow night.
But all uh, information about Skudik Institute programs always on our website. Uh, love to have you sign up for our email newsletter or follow our social media accounts. And uh, you can also find the same for Frenchman Bay Conservancy. Yes? It's a birding program. I believe it's at 8.30. For that one, space is limited. So that one, you, you would need to go to our website, scudicinstitute.org, or call our front desk and uh, register for that one. Thanks again. Uh, appreciate you being here. And thank you, Aaron. Have a great evening. <laughs>